Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, what archaeology can teach us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of people who work in archaeology in the Middle East to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark from La Sierra University. I direct the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology. The associate director, one of the associate directors, uh, Dr. Larry Garrity, is my co-host and he is on assignment. Another co-director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology is Dr. Kent Bramlett, who teaches archaeology and the history of antiquity at La Sierra, and who has long been engaged, what, for 20 going on? 20, to, 20 and going on something and, there. And, and 20 plus 20 years plus. now, uh, working in, in Jordan primarily. But you've worked in uh, Turkey, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah, a little bit. So, and you, like Larry Garrity and like I, do like to think about archaeology and um, the Bible together. And that's why we're walking through the Bible book it, by book and examining is. these things. We have explored lots of different kinds of literature and we have more to go. We haven't even begun to look at the prophets, so we have more to do. This time and this episode is dedicated to exploring one of the wisdom books, the book of Ecclesiastes, or Kohelet as it is known in uh, in the original. Kohelet, what does that word mean? Well, it comes from the word meaning to, to assemble, uh, to call together. So it would be someone like uh, um, a speaker at a, a convocation, um, literally a preacher, uh, something like along that line. In fact, I think that's why it gets translated. I guess in the German, Der Prediger, I remember seeing that. Uh, I don't know which if that was a Martin Luther translation or what. Mm -hmm. But it does get translated then into English by some as preacher, mm -hmm. but probably more. Maybe, maybe a convener, somebody who's calling people together as well as calling out to them, something like that. Mm -hmm. But we will see that name uh, when we look at the outline here momentarily too. So Kohelet is the Hebrew name. What about your encounters with Ecclesiastes. I'm, 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 I'm going to go back to your childhood too. So think about this book and whether you ever showed any interest in it uh, as a child growing up and why it might be interesting to you now. I don't remember it from my childhood. Well, sure, Ecclesiastes. But as far as thinking about the content, it was one of the books you name off when you say the, the books <laughs> of the Bible in, in order. Uh, but as far as the content, I don't remember too much. The making of books, you know, that, that um, there, the making of books, there's, there's no, no end. end. Right. That, of course, was familiar and other phrases from it. But as far as thinking about the message of the book, not until much later. Uh, and it, it fascinates me deeply. It's so different. It's like, where, where does this fit in the thoughts of the biblical world? It, it's, it seems more existentialist. I mean, it, it seems more of a modern um, struggle with the meaning of life than it does something we would expect out of the ancient world. I think that's a good way to describe it. It probably is the most modern, at least modern sounding of the biblical books. There is a tenor to it which has carried us into issues that concern us in the modern world. And uh, we'll talk about dating, which is a bit of a challenge. It uh, builds on the notion of, of Solomon, but then it kind of separates itself from Solomon. So there may be an attempt to say, if I were Solomon, this is how this would work. I mean, people, scholars have debated about this. Been a lot of discussion. And, and when you have late words, mm -hmm. Greek words in it that don't show up elsewhere before the third, fourth century, one has to say, okay, this is interesting. We at least have to think about it. Um, it's the kind of wisdom, I think I've heard you use the word philosophical before, mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe more traditional or pragmatic or practical wisdom. Mm -hmm. Very much struggling with the meaning of life. He says, look, I've seen the righteous, uh, well, it starts out, I've seen the uh, wicked who prosper. I've seen the righteous perish in their good works, basically. And that doesn't make sense according to the old paradigms. And the old paradigm is the book of Deuteronomy, right? I mean, it, primarily. It, that's sort of the foundational the document of, of that view, where God blesses those who do right, who follow him. And the curses only fall upon those who do uh, evil, or for a reason, usually tied to um, unresolved uh, wickedness. Right. And um, 
there were observers in the ancient world who said this doesn't always seem to work, doesn't explain what we've seen. And Ecclesiastes struggles with that. The Kohelet, the, the, the right. voice of the books, um, struggles with that reality. And I think, uh, well, he, he doesn't explain it. He comes to a, a, a resolution or a solution or a prescription perhaps, but he doesn't um, give us an understanding of why on a deep level. So there's, there seem to be unanswered questions. Maybe what we walk away from this book with is a sense that here's somebody who honestly grappled with it. Now that doesn't mean that a book like Proverbs doesn't honestly grapple with life. Yeah. Different ways, different perspectives. What's been interesting to me for, I don't know, time I began thinking about the Old Testament professionally, that here you have Proverbs, traditional, predictable, Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. and right next to it is Ecclesiastes, which is questioning and doubt and skepticism. Are, are, are skepticism and doubt four-letter words? Are they bad words? In some circles, <laughs> at some times, I think. You know, I think the creation of the, the canon, the, the books in the Bible, uh, you know, are, are put in their places for reasons. Now, the order differs a little bit in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, but we get books juxtaposed like that because, you know, that, that's part of our, our, it's part of the divine plan. It's part of the revelation. Why um, would they be placed like that? It's because there are different voices. Mm -hmm. And at different points in our life, we need to read different things. And Ecclesiastes is part of that. There may be moments, I like the way you put that, times in our lives when we might be actually drawn to uh, mm -hmm. one, one reading or another about life. And let's face it, life is not an, an even keel. Uh, life puts us into painful situations, which then probably draw us more to books like Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. Not just a predictable book, because what has happened is not predictable, and it's not right, and it's not just, and it's not fair. So let me read somebody who knows what mm -hmm. I mean, and you go to Ecclesiastes. So, so maybe that is a good reason. It's a little bit like the going back to the existentialists that leap in the of faith in the dark. Uh, it's you know you just in the end you get out there and live life, and make the most of it, um, and you will probably struggle with questions from time to time. And Ecclesiastes tells us that indeed the the book, the presence of the book in the Bible, right. tells us that biblical people had questions too and struggled with these deep meanings. And I think if we were honest with each other, probably most people do. I, I think I've referred earlier to the, <clears throat> what, the memoirs or some kind of uh, letters from uh, Mother Teresa, right. who's, I, I don't think they were published until after her death, mm -hmm. but they were serious. I mean, they were serious questions about God about God and poverty, and about God and putting her in that situation. So, yeah, we ought to have a book that we can go to. I mean, mm -hmm. the Bible should be big enough to include those of us with different, in different places in our lives and with different situations. So, I do like that. In fact, I think Ecclesiastes is, uh, it's one of my favorite books. Uh, has a number of things to contribute to how life doesn't always turn out how we expect it to, and how to keep going. Mm -hmm. And primarily, now this is going to sound a little sexist, but mm -hmm. it's to love your life, your wife, and your work. Ultimately, that's what it is. Be happy with your life, your wife, and your work. Ooh, ooh, let's put spouse in there, okay? Mm -hmm. So your life, your spouse, right. and your work. That doesn't sound kind of like the high theological dissertations of Romans. Uh, where we are supposed to be sorting out salvation issues. Well, for Ecclesiastes, of course, there's a time for everything. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, enjoy. Enjoy food, feasting, fun, and your work. That's it's different. A, it's, a, it's a different. Uh, <laughs> we wouldn't expect to find that in, no. in uh, say, Jeremiah no. or somewhere. So we want to think about those things, and we'll have some slides to illustrate that. But as usual, before that, we have some artifacts in front of us. Tell us what these are. Well, we tried to illustrate some of the themes in Ecclesiastes. Um, you already mentioned a time for uh, right. that um, 
a series of, of uh, um, seasons in life, I guess. Uh, so time for war, time for feasting. Um, we have illustrations here, of course, weapons. We've illustrated that before. Um, it's part of the reality of life at that time. Nowadays, we, uh, the, those fortunate go through their entire life not at least seeing firsthand, right. uh, experiencing firsthand war. Right. Now, plenty of people do. So a time for peace then. At a time, yes. So we got them both. We yep. have them both. A time for just the enjoyment of of food, a family. So we have, again, vessels which illustrate cooking and eating, um, probably uh, liquids here, libations or other oils, um, and the production of clothing for you know, well, everyday there's clothing. A, there's a time to sew, there's a time uh, to tear apart. There so, is. Mm -hmm. yes, we have these. So again, it's just a, uh, a variety of artifacts that most people in the ancient world would have needed. And they come to play, especially in the list of times in chapter three. A time to mm -hmm. die, a time to, uh, well, no, it's a time to live and a time to die. There's a time to sow and a time to tear, a time for war, a time for peace. Mm -hmm. At the end of that set of times, it's very interesting to me, mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, I think it's in chapter, er, in verse 11 of chapter three, where God has placed into the human heart, use of the word olam, which is sometimes translated forever, uh, sometimes as far as you can imagine, one yeah. way or another. So God has placed, I actually like to call it curiosity about maybe the future and past, but mm -hmm. God has placed that in the human heart. But according to Kohelet, God still draws a curtain across and we really never will get to all of the answers. See, that's the kind of thing that I think leads him to say, okay, we can know some things, we can't know everything, the best thing to do is the best we can. Um, what your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. And that especially means enjoying. We don't read it that way, but in context, enjoy in the best way you can. Uh, so life, spouse, and work, uh, and enjoy them. That's a good thought, I think. It is, it is. Very especially, I mean, it's better than suffering under the uh, dismal, what, despair that life mm -hmm. can bring. Sometimes you just move on. Uh, and just live. And, and enjoy it and enjoy in the process. It. So we want to look at this book and some parallels, and we will look first of all at the outline. Kent, kind of uh, walk us through this, help us to see what's here. Right, well, we're introduced with that title. We've already talked about the Hebrew term Kohelet. Um, and for the first, well, chapter and a little bit, we've got a poem, and it's sort of setting the context, I think, the existential travail. Right. And, and, and we'll look at a parallel, an Egyptian parallel, that is kind of close. It's not exactly this, but because this is profound. When you read this through, it's profound. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You can, everything keeps coming around the same. You know, don't expect anything. Despondent. I mean, and it is, it is despondent. Um, Kohelet moves on. He explores life for several chapters here. And um, he makes conclusions in our section four, uh, several chapters there. Uh, reflections on youth and old age. So this is really the, uh, I guess, the advice that uh, grows out of his experiences and reflections. And then there's a short epilogue. Now, the reflections on youth and old age, it's really interesting. I mean, you read it and there are probably several levels. I mean, mm. the silver cord has broken, the golden chain has broken, the pot has broken. And I mean, old age, I mean, you know, everything's falling Practically apart. Shakespearean. Yeah, yeah. And then the beginning, remember God in the days of your youth, because when you get old, these things keep changing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, He's it's, not your it's, religious. Right, not at all. Um, but it is captured in a different sort of way, yeah. which I think is holistic, um, our, our whole selves. Now the end, the epilogue, some people have uh, suggested, especially, and I have um, in my version of the Bible here, this is Revised Standard Version, in chapter 12, verse nine, there is a, really a break. It actually comes to a conclusion at, in verse eight, um, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That's a bookend there and at the beginning of the book. <clears throat> but the, books keep go the book keeps going. And some people have argued that what goes on, like, other than being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging proverbs, etc. Sought pleasing words. The sayings of the wise are like goads. Don't forget that. Don't, do, don't spend too much time at it. Mm -hmm. Of the making of many books, 
wisdom books, books like this, there is no end. And study is a weariness of the flesh. So don't, don't spend too much time with what's been said here. And then at the end, the end of the matter is fear God, keep his commandments because of the rewards. It's back to Deuteronomy. It is. So some people are arguing that we have, even within this book, a couple of voices, whether it was the same author who then added that as a kind of a foil to what mm -hmm. he'd said before, which would be very creative, mm -hmm. or someone else that said, okay, we've, we've grappled with this long enough. Um, students like the verse about too much study is a weariness yeah. of the flesh. But for here, too much thinking about this kind of thing. And so, you know, let's remember, we are accountable. So, I mean, we have them right here in the same book. It's a great, a great way to put a book together, I think. Mm -hmm. We'll see how scholarship comes down on that in the end. In any case, the uh, epilogue brings us to that interesting conclusion. So some issues, we've actually talked about some of these before. The cosmopolitan nature of wisdom, the Egyptian and Mesopotamian connections, the connections with uh, the Bible and these other texts, and then enjoying one's work, and we've talked about that. So, <clears throat> so we will turn to the writings of Keti. You've read this before, Kent, um, when we looked at Proverbs and writing, but I think it fits so well here too. And this is this wonderful satire on labor positions, different types of employment. So read this for us. Learn to write, my son. I have seen how many other kinds of work destroys workers. Writing, learning to write can save you from all this suffering. As it says in the book of Goals, become a scribe, fulfilling others' needs, and you will never be poor. No other profession may make this claim. I will make you see that writing is to be loved even more than your mother. <laughs> and that's true. And even the other, no, no other profession can make the claim that you won't be poor. Right. This, this is a bit of overstatement, but that's how satires work. <clears throat> the woodcutter is more wretched than a farmer. The jeweler works hard stones every day. The barber shaves from dawn until dusk, makes himself a slave to the chins of the world. The potter is condemned to dwell in the clay while still among the living. The gardener bears a yoke. The fisherman's job is worst of all. If you know how to write, you will do better than any of these other workers. You will be your own boss. It is my responsibility to make this journey with you to the city where the pharaoh sits. Your time as an apprentice is no more than a day. Your work as a scribe will last for an eternity, longer than the mountains. The time will pass quickly, very quickly. We wonder if he was successful in this sales job, um, <clears throat> bringing people into the uh, guild of, of scribes, the scribal guild. So very interesting. And just a fun sort of thing. I mean, it's so much tongue in cheek. And we left off part of the text, which would have explained why a woodcutter, a woodcutter is worse off than a farmer. We would have known that and so on. But in any case, it's a fun text to think about. We do have some artifacts to think about. And one set of artifacts is going to be tied to eating and drinking. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you die. That is found not just in Greek hedonistic philosophers, that is found in Ecclesiastes. But probably not hedonistic. I think it's part of this, there are conundrums that drive us crazy. The way to survive is to eat and drink and enjoy your, your life, your spouse, and your work. I think it's part of that whole tradition. Think about it. So we'll look at some, uh, well, we actually have looked at some uh, artifacts tied to textiles and war and peace and so on. We'll look at some tied to unguents because precious ointments does come up in this book. <clears throat> and maybe something about the kinds of writing and literature around. Mm -hmm. Ken, I would say this is a favorite sort of collection from Megiddo. It's a very nice collection, a tomb assemblage. Uh, all of the uh, vessels here needed to supply uh, some belief, uh, no doubt, among the Canaanites in an afterlife. So we have a cooking pot, there would be food, probably actually a, a last meal eaten with, with the relatives dur during the process of burial, but then left. I mean, there's clearly not only that burial ceremony, but also something left for, mm. for the afterlife. Mm. Oh, that beautiful biconical uh, <laughs> vessel there, the big one in the middle, I, with yep. scenes, um, uh, very <coughs> symbolic scenes. The, the um, ibex is um, nibbling the branches of a tree. 
again, a symbol probably for Asherah. We see this in different guises. And maybe tied in some ways to the Tree of Life, or at least uh, to this, a living this, tree. Yeah, source. This, this symbol oh, is very right, ancient, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, the, the big vessel on the left is, is a crater. It's a Greek name, but is usually used for mixed drinks, water mixed with wine, certainly in the Greek world. And then uh, some other ritual artifacts. I mean, a lamp. Everybody needs a lamp for, for um, these ceremonies in, in the, the dark. Uh, and a bronze bowl, very nice. Mm -hmm. Would we call this a, um, a, a kind of a traditional uh, assemblage, or could we call this festal? I mean, it's, it is for food. It is for a banquet. Yeah, it's not an everyday setting. Right, right. This is something special. Okay. So let's look at some other artifacts. These are two small vessels. Mm. What are they used for? Well, for um, <coughs> perfumes. The one on the left can actually be fairly large. Um, but again, it, very precious contents. I mean, those spindle bottles, those are very, very well made. That beautiful burnish, the, the red burnish on them. Uh, and the one on the right, again, this would be a very small opening. You could cork it off, preserve the precious contents, perfumes, uh, sometimes medicinal. Some analysis uh, showing really rare spices. I mean, cinnamon coming all the way from the Spice Islands and what's now Indonesia mm -hmm. from the time of Solomon on. I mean, this is recent research that has proven that. Right. So probably very valuable contents. Well, now we want to look at some banqueting scenes. I mean, if in fact, Kohelet, the author, the, the, the main figure in, um, in Ecclesiastes is inviting us to enjoy, then food is part of that. And so we have several banquet scenes. Uh, this one, Egyptian, of course, and one can see as one looks, especially in the lower register. I'm not sure if this is, the, the, in the very far right, is a place where you would go to get food. I'm just not sure what that is. Um, I'm sure art historians have told us. But you have some celebrative dancing going on, uh, um, gossip, okay, conversation going on. Um, and then you do see, not so much in this one as we'll see in others, where the, the, most, the majority of the eating is taking place. Right. We'll see that in some of the others. This one's similar. What do we see on this one, Kent? Oh, it's a great um, banquet scene. The servants are, are providing the, the food. We have breads coming in. We have good, um, fruit, probably grapes, and others. And then the nicely garbed and quaffed um, ladies are sitting down and they're, they're sharing conversation and, and food. Now these chairs, these are rather like modern chairs. Well, they are, aren't that they? That was a, mm -hmm. how far back, okay, this is a on the spot question. How far back do these go in Egyptian iconography? Well, um, certainly the Middle Kingdom, um, probably third millennium. I'm, yeah. I, I could say certainly the second millennium without a question. We don't see many of these in, for instance, in, uh, in Palestine, Israel, Palestine. Uh, no, we don't. And look at the cushions on the chairs. I mean, these are not even hard wooden chairs. <laughs> these are very comfortable. <laughs> Another one. This one I like a lot, partly because of its color. Right. Partly because of the shapes of these people, including these incredibly amazing schnozes, these noses. I mean... Uh, when we get to the Song of Songs, which we'll do soon mm -hmm. in, a, in an episode coming up, we'll talk about beauty and the noses and how... Celebration of the strong features, they, they I guess. They are. Mm -hmm. They really are. So this is Babylonian. Um, right. It Typical reminds place. me of, of Ur, but I don't, I'm not sure. So that would be early. Or even earlier, I think, yeah, it's almost Sumerian. Another one, this one Babylonian, and you have somebody seated at the right side of the register at both levels, and then food being brought to them. That's what it looks like, is what's happening here. Assyria. So feasting going on, you see somebody with a, what, a bowl, something? Mm -hmm. um, There's maybe like the king on his throne, on, uh, seated oh. higher than everybody else. It has to be, it has mm -hmm. to be. And so we have several people gathered for this. I'm not sure what they're all doing. This one's pretty clear. Uh, someone seated up in the upper register on the right, food being brought, and then the other registers, food being collected, and music. So Food and music. We have food and music. That's part of the celebration. It seems to me that this kind of world is what our book has in mind. This being happy, eating, drinking, being merry, um, and celebrating life and spouse and work. A long one here. 
Right, and, and look at the um, hierarchy at the top are the individuals enjoying the, um, what the lower two registers are producing. So the servants and the lower levels are bringing animals or packing in um, f the food and the produce and putting on this banquet that the individuals then at the top, the musicians playing the harps, and um, we don't really know the context of, of the celebration, but probably one of the annual festivals. Right, right. And so we have a number of pictures like this. A couple of things on writing. I'm going to go through these quickly. We've uh, shown them before with Proverbs. Um, inkwell here, um, stylus of some kind for that ink for writing on papyrus. Papyrus on the right, clay on the left, an ostracon uh, inked, and then a uh, popular one, scrolls. I do want to get to the dialogue of pessimism before our program runs out this time. Um, the teachings of Ketty we've already looked at, and we've, we've read The Sufferer and a Soul, and so I am going to skip past those. Some Babylonian, what, uh, pessis, pessimists, maybe doubters, uh, maybe skeptics is a better word. Um, but I want to get to, uh, I want to go past this one, we have seen it before, to this, to the Babylonian dialogue of pessimism. Because this one, I think, is so close to Ecclesiastes. And so, Kent, let's uh, do some alternating reading here. This, this actually has ten stanzas to it, and then a conclusion. We're not going to read all of them. Slave, listen to me. Here I am, master. Here I am. Quickly. Fetch me water for my hands. I want to dine. Dine, master, dine. A good meal relaxes the mind. The meal of his God. To wash one's hand passes the time. Oh, well, slave, I will not dine. D do not dine, master, do not dine. To eat only when one is hungry, to drink only when one is thirsty is best for man. <laughs> this pattern it is, continues to develop. Slave, listen to me. Here I am, master, here I am. Quickly, fetch me my chariot. I'm going to hunt. Drive, master, drive. A hunter gets his belly filled. The hunting dog will break the bones of the prey. The raven that scours the country can feed its nest. The fleeting onager can, or finds rich pastures. Oh, well, slave, I will not hunt. Oh, do not go, master, do not go. The hunter's luck changes. The hunting dog's teeth will get broken. The raven that scours the country has a hole in the wall as a home. The fleeting onager has the desert as his stable. So this goes on and on, but let's get to the very last. Mm -hmm. So all of these verses. He keeps verses, thinking about what might go it wrong. It does, but this one. Okay, read the, read the final one. Slave, listen to me. Here I am, master, here I am. What then is good? To have my neck and yours broken? Or to be thrown into the river? Is that good? Who is so tall as to ascend to heaven? Who is so broad as to encompass the entire world? Oh, well, slave, I will kill you and send you first. Yes, but my master would certainly not survive me for three days. So all of this play comes down to we're not sure how to solve these big issues. Uh, it's, it's a fun way to get at it, but mm. it's still, we don't have the answers. Thank you, Kent, and thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark. <laughs>